Welcome to the Every Day is a New Day podcast and live show. The inspirational show about moving forward and choosing to be more of you. Transmuting the self-doubt and stepping into courageously aligned confidence in who you uniquely are. My name is Kim O'Neill. I'm a twice certified transformational confidence coach, Reiki master, best-selling author, and former crime analyst who now helps empathic heart-centered individuals shatter the noise of self-doubt, find clarity on what self-love really looks like, and the courage to be peacefully grounded in who you've always known you are from the inside out. Join me for the live shows on Facebook and YouTube and visit KimO'NealCoaching.com for more info. Let's get to it. I'm really excited to be here with today's guest, Brian Falchuk. Welcome, Brian. Thanks for having me on, Kim. Absolutely. I'm really excited to have you here because your expertise and, and what you talk about, and I'm going to share your bio in just a moment, um, is very relevant to a lot of stuff that's coming up for people in the world today. Yeah. And so this is just excellent timing. Um, but I want to first ask you a really fun question. And will you tell us about your awesome new hairdo? Yeah. Um, so I like to call this a mohawk. The problem is I'm, I'm kind of, I'm getting older, so it's kind of balding in the back. So it's more of a tuft. Someone told me the other day, but we're going to go with mohawk. Um, look, we're all, we're all stuck inside and a lot of what I do is public speaking and I'm not going on stage anytime soon for several months. So, um, you know, when, uh, when schools were closed, my son, who's a fifth grader, he, he was like, dad, can we do Mohawks? Cause like, we're not going anywhere. It's like, yeah, you know, like we need a bit of smiling. So hence, hence the hair. And I don't know, we'll see if it sticks. Maybe I have like a new positioning as like the, the Mohawk executive or so. I don't know, but, um, it's kind of fun. And I am sad for the day that it won't be here anymore. Um, I do have an event coming up, like a, a, pretty professional webinar kind of thing. I'm like, could I wear a hat for that? Or if I just kind of grease it down, I don't know, or just, just embrace it. Right. Like we all need a smile. So absolutely. I, I love that. What a fun, I just imagine what a fun treat that is for your son. Who's like, Oh my gosh, my dad said yes to doing a mohawk. Yeah. His isn't as uh, shaved down on the sides because his mom would be pretty angry. Um, and we're all clothed in the same, you know, small space right now. So like happy wife is very important. But yes. um, I have to say like, he wears it really well. Even she was like, actually, that looks pretty good. And, and she was not for it going in. So maybe, maybe his will stick and mine won't. I don't know. Well, you know, from, from the front, you know, here just on the camera, it looks great. And cool. yeah, so awesome. Thank you. Absolutely. So, okay. So for everyone who's just getting to meet Brian Falchuk for the very first time, let me share a little bit about his background with you. And then we're going to get into our conversation. So Brian Falchuk is a three times TEDx speaker, best-selling author, podcast host, executive coach, and certified behavior change specialist. He regularly speaks on the subjects of motivation, culture, interpersonal dysfunction, and overcoming challenges. And his first book, do a day teaches the philosophy he developed to find your true motivation, set meaningful goals and achieve them by freeing yourself of judgment from the past, as well as fear from the future. His latest book, the 50, 75, 100 solution builds better relationships, helps people see their power to make their relationships happier, healthier, and happier. He's been a guest on over 150 podcasts and radio shows, written many articles for top publications like Inc. Magazine, the LA Times, Chicago Tribune, Business Insider, and more. And he is a former C-level executive in the insurance and tech sectors, as well as a top management consultant, and loves to feature inspiring people who have overcome and achieved something better for themselves on his show, the Do-A-Day podcast. And that is Brian in a nutshell. That's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. Yeah, yeah. You did very I, well with it. Oh, thank you. Well, yeah. you know, and I, I just, I pare them down, you know, but I also want to like get the full picture. And I love, yeah. you know, the diversity that people have, just like what we shared in your podcast or in your, from your bio. So, okay. So Brian, let's talk about first do a day. Yes. Do a day. So um, I love what I've learned about, you know, what that means, but will you share in your words, what does do a day mean? And how did you come up with that? Yeah. Um, so do a day, uh, I guess I came up with it. It was sort of forced, uh, forced upon me by life. And I was yeah. willing to be open to that. And I think that's how a lot of us make the major changes that, 
we wish we could make and should make. Um, some of us are lucky enough to be willing to do that without having these sort of gun in your face moments. But I had mine, um, not quite that, but um, okay. my wife, I will start by saying my wife is alive. And as I tell oh. the story, you'll understand why I, I preface it with that. Um, so my backstory is one of a pretty extreme anxiety on the back of my parents' divorce when I was really young. And I just sort of always felt like um, everything was coming apart because little kids need to feel taken care of. And I didn't. It's not a knock on my parents. It's just like, look, you know, the family unit's coming apart. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of fighting, a lot of change. Um, and I was really little and couldn't do anything about it. And so I started to try to calm that anxiety, really not as a conscious decision, but I just started eating a lot all the time for an emotional hunger. And food doesn't actually do anything for emotional hunger. Um, so yeah, I put on a lot of weight pretty quickly, like between age five and six, if you look at a picture of me, I look like two different kids. Um, so I, I spent my childhood um, really obese, I was about 100 pounds overweight. And I lost it in high school um, just through exercise and honestly, bulimia, um, and not through like sticking my finger down my throat, but through excessive exercise, really controlling what I eat. Um, so, you know, sort of anorexia, but it, it wouldn't really qualify as that because I still ate really well. Okay. Um, I was just very much in control of it. So like I wasn't going out for dinner. You know, I live with my mom. I wasn't going to go see my dad for dinner like I used to because I can't control what a restaurant's doing. Okay. Um, so, you know, li little things like that. But I lost the weight, but I didn't change me. So I still had all the same anxiety. And it actually served me really well a lot of the time. Um, okay. You know, I, I was super independent. I was unbelievably reliable. Like you mentioned, I was a management consultant. I was paid to find problems and jump on them. Um, so that's kind of my anxiety. Like I was actually rewarded for my anxiety. So as much as I was unhappy and probably not the greatest person to be around, all signs were like, dude, this is why you're surviving. So it ain't so bad. Um, you know, the sky's always falling in my view, and I'm fully capable of stopping that from crushing me. So I was building my anxiety up instead of dealing with it and pulling it back. So as a result of that, despite losing the 100 pounds, um, fast forward a bunch of years, uh, 2011, I was 32, married with a two-year-old, and I had put half the weight back on. And this is when my moment hit me is uh, that summer, my wife got really sick. Uh, she's a chronic illness that reared its head and it got to a point where she was bedridden, weighed about a hundred pounds and was losing two pounds every day. And of course our son had a front row seat to that. Um, mm. June 30th of that year, her primary care doctor um, called to let me know he was going on vacation and there's really nothing else that can be done. And so he'll check back with me when he's back in six weeks. And I just said, you know, doctor, do the math. Like, two pounds every day. She's not going to be here in six weeks. And he just goes, okay, we'll take her to the ER. And then he hung up. Um, oh my gosh. Yeah. Uh, so with that, uh, kind of really, uh, just ridiculous and, and, um, shocking interaction. And then I have to walk back into our bedroom and my son's standing at the foot of the bed, looking at his mom. Um, she's, she's a stay at home mom. Like she's full on about him and Wow. She's, you know, she's not now and I'm staying home from work um, to take care of him and her. And it's just, it's very confusing for him. But when he turned and looked at me, his eyes met mine, like that was it. And that was the moment do a day was born as I was just hit with this very profound sense of failing the two of them. And I was failing her because I was, I was doing everything, mm -hmm. but I wasn't standing with her because I was so caught up in the anxiety that I couldn't just, you know, when she was sort of spiraling with her own fears, totally understandably. I was like, you know, you have to do this and you have to stop worrying about that. And cause I'm about like, fix, fix, fix. Okay. And she just needed someone to like hold her and be like, this is really scary. Like, do you need to cry? Do you need me to hold, like not, you need to toughen up. If, right. if you've seen the movie airplane, when people are lining up to smack this hysterical woman in the face, like that doesn't work. Right. And I wasn't doing that. But in a sense, I wasn't really doing any better. Okay. So, you know, I'm failing her at the worst moment of her life. And I'm failing my son. And it, for myself, like feeling like, you know, the sky was falling and I wasn't being taken care of as a little kid. I wasn't okay. 
he's in the same boat, only I say like it's 10, 100,000 times worse. Right. Um, he's losing his mom. And I just, I'm failing him as a father because it's like, Daddy, will you read to me? It's like, no, I have to go cook. I have to do this. I have to do that. And because I've got my own issues and I'm freaking out, but it's like that right. little boy just needs to know it's okay. And if he has any shot of happiness in life, it's not going to be with me being his only parent. And so in feeling that failure and responsibility for the two of them, that's where I felt this power, this sense of like, this has got to stop. And I went to sleep, like it was later in the day. So, you know, to the whole bedtime routine for the two of them and went to bed and I woke up in the morning and I still had that feeling. That was really different because I've had moments of like power, inspiration, or whatever. It's like, you know, then a show comes on and you forget or whatever. Um, this is really different and it still felt as intense, maybe even more so. And I was okay. like, look, this is a lifeline. And if I don't figure out why I'm feeling this, like what are the pieces of this that's driving this feeling me, I'm going to lose this chance because this is, this is that pivot for me. And those two people deserve that. Um, just that right there yeah. is really is really interesting and and um, awesome because I can see a lot of people at that point just saying, not wanting to necessarily, but kind of just feeling helpless and giving up and saying, yeah. I, "There's nothing I can do." Yeah. But rather, you said, "What can I do? Like, how can I shift this?" And you really got into. I that. have to. I have because I like I was burning out hard. Like, there's just too much pressure on me. I was scared. You know, people are like, "Oh, you only have one kid." like questioning and I'm like, yeah, you know, and then I give them a little bit of, you know, my wife has an illness and it reared its head kind of at that moment where we were, we would have been talking about a second kid if we were going to have more, okay. but you know, um, we were thinking we were building a family and, and instead it was like family's going to dramatically change and be two. Um, that's not what you expect when you're in your early thirties, you know, right. we've been married a few years, but relatively speaking, newlyweds, um, just not it's not what we you know what we right. expected at all so how did where did the do a day concept yeah. come in then um so i i decided there are things that i could change i can't yeah. save my wife's life i can right. help her in her doing that but i can't just like jump into her body and make her well um but i can support her differently i can support my son differently i need to do something about this weight situation you know i can't i can't constantly be um, I used to describe myself as like, I spent the first half of my life obese and the second half trying not to be, which is not like a great way to describe your life. You didn't mention that at all in the bio that, that you recited, right? Like that's not how to live. So I'm like, I'm going to fix that once and for all. Wow. Um, and the second was the anxiety and I had every excuse in the book not to do it. And it's kind of funny. The anxiety was the excuse for not dealing with the anxiety. It was like, yeah, it's, taking it's interesting because it. right. Well, it's interesting because um, it, was, it was actually a nice, well, how you were using it to fuel yeah. all the goodness and the success that was that that you were experiencing, but um, pretty also wise and and insightful to notice that wait, this actually isn't helping. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And what okay. what I wasn't able to do yet was recognize how unhappy I was because I it's not that I didn't recognize it; it's that I didn't value it. Like I wasn't, I wasn't good with myself yet to think okay. that I might be a reason to do better. Like I, I could do it for my son and for my wife, but I wasn't yet at a place and I am today, but I wasn't back then where it was like, wait, you deserve to not feel this way. Cause I didn't like it either. Right. Um, so yeah, I just, I didn't love myself enough for that yet. And I got oh. there, but it took, it took six more years. Okay. Um, and the third was my job had been awesome and was less awesome. Um, the, I joined uh, an amazing company under the founder and he unfortunately um, had stomach cancer and passed away. And so new folks took over are great, but just very different values. And the company had, was becoming really political and that's just not me. Okay. Um, I'm a Mohawk, you know, like I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not into the backstabbing kind of games. And mm -hmm. so I knew I needed to start planting seeds for my next job. Um, before it got to the point where those seeds were being forced upon me. Like I, I wanted okay. to plot my own path. So those are the three things I focused on. And with all of them, um, it really was just like losing the weight. 
like when I lost a hundred pounds the first time around, there were so many fits and starts that ended within hours of beginning because the sense of how much that is, is crushing. And what you realize is like, you don't lose a hundred pounds in a day. Right. You just do what you do in this moment to put yourself a little further ahead. And it's the sum total of that. You know, when I was thinking about going to talk to someone about my anxiety, I would be like, how am I going to make a hundred appointments work and the cost and the time? And, you know, now I've got like, not just my job, but all these burdens at home and things that are I'm responsible for. And I'm the only one who can do. And like, it's like, well, you're not making a hundred appointments work right now. You just have to find time for one. You just have to pay for one. It doesn't matter whether you can afford all of them or not. Like they're not all happening in this moment. And that's, that's the notion of where do a day started to come out for me is, mm -hmm. Most of us live caught between yesterday and tomorrow. So yesterday is like the pain, the regret, or the longing. Maybe it can be for something good too, but it's all those things that we're thinking about from before. Right. And we bring them to this moment and they weigh on us today. And so we give up a piece of our, our experiences right now right. for that past. And we do it with tomorrow too. And that's where I really focused was all of the terrible things that were going to happen. Look, we're living in the midst of... A yes. great example of this right now. How long are we going to be home for? And how am I going to pay the bills? And what if this? And what if I get it? And where? what if we run out of food? All of those things are valid, real possibilities. And you don't know whether any of them will happen. But when you take yourself out of this moment and you think about all of those, not only are you making it harder on yourself, but you're taking away your ability to do the things you could do right here, right now that may make those possibilities just never come to pass. You know, you, you cower and you, you get all wrapped up in it and you miss chances to connect with someone that makes you feel better or maybe opens a door for a new opportunity. Or they say, hey, you know, I'm going to the supermarket. Can I get you something? So you're not going to run out of food or you make a right. smarter choice about that food. So your body's healthier. So it's more able to stand up to all the illness that's out there, Wh whatever it is. But when we succumb to yesterday and tomorrow, we give up the present moment. And in doing that, we lose out in our ability to achieve the things that I wouldn't even say we dream of achieving because most of the things that I've done weren't even on my list. Like I, I didn't even, I just went through this with my son this morning. He was like, this math problem is too hard. And I was like, let's talk about challenges. Like you're not even willing to try it. And I'm like, there's so many mm -hmm. things that we do that we couldn't even have thought, you know, right. like, yet we've done them. I, so I love this. So do a day is really about what can you do just right now yeah. today yeah. and, and not focusing or allowing yesterday or tomorrow to take up your energy. Yeah. And, and, um, and I just want to go ahead and take a quick moment and say hello to our live viewers. I see Darcy is here with us and, um, you know, feel free to say hi, let us know if you have questions, what questions are coming up for you right now in your present experience about mindfulness and about allowing yourself to just, you know, focus on what you do have control over in this moment. Brian, I can't even say it enough. I'm so grateful for this conversation today. Yeah, me too. Oh, so, okay. Okay. You, I don't know if you were going to go there, but will you share some of those things that you just started to say, yeah. you know, you've been able to accomplish more things than what you thought because you've allowed yourself to be more present in yeah. the present moment. Yeah. What are some of those things? There's, there's a lot of physical things that I've achieved that, um, you know, like I've run a marathon, I've done a bunch of century rides, um, which is for people who don't know, it's a hundred mile bike rides. Um, I didn't know that. And I didn't either before. Um, so, I mean, the fact that I even ride a road bike, like anyway, um, these are all things that, so like the marathon is a great example because maybe <laughs> two or three months before I signed up for the Chicago marathon, I was talking on Facebook with, with a friend of mine who like, we were both running and we were connected on Nike plus at the time and, you know, giving each other kudos. And I was like, yeah, yeah you're doing awesome. You're really putting in miles. She's like, yeah, I feel like, I have a marathon in me before I turned 40. It's a few years ago. And I was like, yeah, good luck with that. Like, I'll, if it's Boston, I'll cheer you on. Like, but um, no <laughs> way, I would say. no way. Like I'd done a half marathon and and I couldn't run for a few months afterward. Cause it just, I was like injured because it, it just took so much out of me. I'm like, never, like I have no interest in that. And just two months later, 
I, I woke up again one morning. It's, the mornings are very dangerous for me. Um, and I just had this clarity of it. And I was like, you know what? Like it really, her comment really did stick with me. I'm like, why no way? And it was wow. all like, cause you're fat. Cause you're not a runner. Cause you're the, the first time someone asked me like, you know, exercise wise, I said like, oh, I'm a runner. And I was alone in my basement. And I remember looking left and right, like someone just saw me say that. And they know I'm lying, right? Yeah. But we do that. So like, there's there's just, there's things like that. Um, yeah, writing the books, you know, I'm. I'm almost finished my third book. It goes my editor next week. You, your second book just came out. <laughs> I know. I started it before the second one was even released. Um, wow. But uh, it, it's a business book. It's very different from the first two. Um, but I was like, I got C's in English in high school. You know, I, I was, I was not like I did better in college. Like I kind of found my niche with writing, but I don't know, how could I write a book? I wrote for a major publication. Like I wrote 30 something articles for Inc. Like me, I remember sending in the, um, my pitch to them and I'm like, I'm never going to hear from these people. Cause like, why would they? And two weeks later, the editor reached out and I was like, I couldn't believe it. But yeah, so that's another, like, I would never have thought about writing a book or writing for a magazine or any of the things I've done. Doing three Ted talks, TEDx talks still. Yeah. Well, so that was a dream of mine. Um, sort of. So, my, and I talk about this in my third one, but um, when I put out do a day, people are like, what's your, what's your goal with it? And, you know, it's like sell a million copies and retire. I'm like, that sounds great, but that's not actually what I'm going for. I'm going for impact. And I didn't tell them that yet. I gave them two measures of it. The first was I want to be on stage doing a Ted talk. And the second is I want to be in the middle of the woods on a couch with Oprah on Super Soul Sunday. And everyone's with me for the TED talk. And then they just start laughing at me at Super Soul Sunday. But I don't uh. care. Because it's like, look, I'm not on Oprah right now. So by me saying that, the worst thing that happens is nothing. I'm right. st still not on Oprah. Like, the only problem is whether I'm hurt by your response to it. So, okay. So I I love that you even said that. That is that's just... Okay. So... <laughs> I'm going to first just make a note because I want yeah. us to get into, you know, your book, Do A Day, I know focuses on the relationship with yourself yeah. and then your newest book, The 50, 75, 100 Solution. Yes. I think yeah, that was right. Yeah. Title, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's about relationships. And I definitely want to make sure we get there. Yes. Um, but before we get there, I love that you're bringing up how the um, being present with just today really made a difference in your own level of self-belief and mm -hmm. what you can accomplish. And so will you help us just connect those two dots? Like how did being mindful and present really help you get to that space where you actually weren't, were able to, <clears throat> I imagine today you can confidently, I mean, you do, you confidently say, you know, I've run a marathon, yeah. right? And I, yeah, I'm a three times TEDx talk, you know, speaker and things like that. So that you're no longer going, oh my gosh, I really just say that, you know? So a little bit, I'm still human, but, yeah. but, I'm, but I'm aware of doing it. Right. So like you say, Ted, I'm like, well, TEDx or you say marathon. And like, there's a part of me that's like, but it didn't go well. Tell her how slow it was. <laughs> but you know what? I still finished the thing. You did. And the good news is next time I do one, it'll be a record because I was sick the first time and it was slow. So like there's a positive spin on it too. Yeah. It's, um, and we all struggle with this and that's fine, but it's that, to me, actually, um, and this is interesting, the first time I, I released Do A Day, this wasn't in there. And it took a podcast I was on where the host called me out for the self, the missing self-love. So for his first anniversary, I re-released it with a whole new section because I realized wow, we can talk about motivation and purpose and goals and achievement and Do A Day is like the execution strategy. We can talk about that all day. But if you don't love yourself, it's a completely pointless conversation. Yes. You will always fight your ability to succeed. If you don't believe you're worthy of it and capable of achieving it, the rest of the conversation is pointless. So that's where I always start. And it's weird. Like I started all of my coaching work always starts with self-love, but I wasn't doing that with myself. And I don't, I don't quite know why. I think I wasn't ready for it. Um, there's, there's a number of different reasons for it, but once once it was made clear to me, I was like, you're absolutely right. And so I was willing to do that work and I'm better for it. And I continue to do it because it's kind of nice. Like, yeah. why not keep working on that? Feeling good about yourself and empowering yourself. I think that 
empowering yourself to achieve better is the best gift you can give yourself every day. Absolutely. It, what And what I hear, because I, the same thing has shown up in, in my world too. What I'm really hearing you say is that the more you are present with yourself, that actually helps you to even see like your own inner dialogue yeah. Yeah. and where to switch things. And I've learned that the deeper you go, the deeper you go. Yeah. And self-love is like at the root of it. Yeah. So I love that you brought that up. Um, yeah. Wonderful. So, okay. So now let's talk about relationships, having yeah. healthier relationships. And you've got this newest book that, that really talks about how people can improve their relationships. Will you tell us more about that? Yeah. So the book's called the 50, 75, 100 solution, which is, um, it sounds like it's about math. It's not, although sort of, because there are fractions in it. But what okay. we're talking about is our piece of the relationship total. So the total is 100, right? 100%. Like that's easy. 50 is pretty easy too. It's like, look at this screen. It's half and half you and me. Like that's every relationship, whether it's two people or two groups of people, like it's me and it's you. Right. And most people get that. And me and maybe that's not how they phrase it. Maybe they see me me versus. So it's me against mm -hmm. you or me versus you. And, and then it becomes adversarial. Intentionally or not, when you see relationships as 50-50, you end up reacting to people you end up feeling like you have no control or agency in their behavior and so you end up with a lot of these like why can't they just love me why won't they just be good to me if they would just see my you know all of these right. like it's it's all oh, i'm gonna point towards your side it's all of them right it's their half and like i'm good I just have to wait for them to wake up to me being good and then it's fine, but I can't change them. And feeling powerless like that tends to lead to even more reactions, uh, negative reactions on our part, because we're already on our back foot. Right. Um, that's not a winning dynamic. So this 50, 50 thing, like, look, that's how I was living. That's how most people engage in relationships when you're not being mindful of it. What I realized, um, you know, my wife and I on the back of her health issues that kind of defined our relationship in a lot of ways and not in a warm, loving equals kind of way, sort of like I was an employee and that's not to say she was the boss, but like, I just kind of worked here. Okay. Um, she and my son were the family and I was that guy, you know, so I was, there's that guy, he's just, you know, he's doing the cooking or the whatever. Um, and then to make matters worse in some respects and probably better or necessary in others, I had a job that took me down to Atlanta five days a week. Wow. Um, so I was commuting every Monday and Friday. And um, so, you know, that doesn't leave a lot of room to reconnect. And um, that just meant we grew apart. And when we had issues, there really wasn't time to work through them. So the two days effectively that I was home, not only was I like scrambling to get lots of things done because I'm a fixer, um, but I, you know, like it was uncomfortable. And so our relationship was just very like cursory. It wasn't, wasn't real. And we butt heads a lot or we bicker a lot and we weren't really solving anything. And I've had all these like, oh, she just valued me. If she saw everything that I do or she knew what I was going through, then maybe, well, it doesn't work that way. And I'm sure she was thinking many of the same things, um, but that dynamic wasn't working. And so um, I started to see a therapist while I was down in Atlanta. So I'm like alone every night. So why not, you know, go see someone. And it was really helpful. Um, you my, mean like a therapist? Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. Not go like start seeing another woman. Yeah, yeah uh, no, well, I, just, it, I it wanted was to show Yeah, yeah, no, I started seeing a therapist. Okay. Um, to my intention was to find coping strategies for dealing with the way my wife was treating me. Oh, and I'm wow. not ashamed to admit that, but that is exactly what I thought I was going for. And she thought I was going to fix all of my problems because I'm a hundred percent wrong in our relationship and she's good. It's just me. So like That's we're both awesome. thinking the exact same thing about each other. And she was, you know, she's talked to someone. So it's like, if, if that, if they'll just fix her, and I'll get my coping mechanisms, then I'll be fine. And she's saying the 100% same thing about me. Like if, if this woman will just fix him and I've got my coping strategies and we'll be fine. Um, so luckily the therapist saw through that. So that was good. Um, and she- I hope you both can laugh about it now. Can you laugh about it? In some yeah, ways? yeah. Okay, um, that's good. For, well, yeah, if we talked about it, yeah. yeah um, okay. So 
I mean, actually, I will say on the whole, I wasn't a huge fan of, of the therapist I saw. Like, I, I think there were a lot of things that weren't clicking, but she did a couple things that were life changing for me. And so like very positive in the experience. One of them was giving me or telling me to, to get a book. It's out of reach. Otherwise, I would grab, ah, I can grab it. That's very bad camera work of me, but okay. this is the greatest thing. Uh, yeah, there you go. Greatest thing I've ever read. It's got lots of markers in it. Um, it's called Open Heart, Clear Mind by a Buddhist okay. monk named Tubtin Chodron. Um, it's incredible. And she's like, you have to read this. So I got it and like, look, I'm alone a lot. I'm sitting on planes a lot, so why not? And I got like 30% through it right after it came. And I was blown away. And what hit me was there were a few core principles that Chodron talks about in Buddhism that really seem to apply. And they help me understand what's going on in this dynamic and not just what's going on on my wife's side, but the influence, the connection that I have to what's going on on her side. And that's not something I saw before. So yeah. there's a there's three principles that I pulled out from what she talks about in this book and others and that are you know core pieces of Buddhism um, that really started to change the game for me. The first was just understanding that we all seek happiness. And so like, what does that even mean? It's like, if someone's being mean to you, it's not like they got up that morning and they're like, you know what I'm going to do later? I'm going to find Brian and just yell at him. Because like, yeah. you no, know, it's like something happens that gets in the way of what they want and they react to that. And I use this analogy. Um, it's a true story, but um, it's, a, it's an analogy I think everyone can understand and getting cut off in traffic. And it's like, maybe other parts of the country don't have this, but in Boston, when we get cut off, you cut the person back off, you scream a lot, even though they can't hear you, you might give them the finger. Like there's, you know, there's just, these are standard cultural responses and none of them works. You know, right. you cut the person off, guess what? They're gonna cut you back off. And we're not maybe the best drivers or we're a bit aggressive up here. So like, or it might be an accident happening. Like, it's not a good scene. But what I can guarantee you is that person did not get on the highway that day looking for your car to get in front of it. They got on the highway that day for the same reason you did, to get somewhere. Like, so the, the story I tell is about a plumber who cut me off. And it's like, I let him cut me off because he made this decision that, like, being one car further ahead would make him happier because he's got to get somewhere. And I said, he's a plumber. Like, maybe someone's pipe burst. It's cold out. Maybe it's like right. an elderly person and he's going to fix their heating system. And that's like going to save a life. My mm -hmm. house is flooded. Like maybe that pipe that burst is going to save someone's home. Right. So their kids have a place to sleep that night versus me. Like I just got off a plane from Atlanta. I'm driving home. And like, yeah, I'd like to get home as quickly as I can because I'm tired. But one car is not going to make a difference. If I get in an accident with him, it will. Right. But it was just recognizing like, that's not about me. He's just trying to be happy, just like I am. And that allows you to instantly just step down your reactions, your anger, your feeling attacked, which gives you the space for mindfulness to come back in because your brain's not on fire with like, must protect myself, you know, I have to fight back. Um, so happiness seeking and applying that and trying to just pot, like, you know, with my wife or with anyone else is like, why are they yelling at me right now? What is it that, they might want and how do they see me as blocking that or competing with that or standing in the way or a threat to it it's not about me as a human being it's not a judgment of me it's about they want something and i want something and the perception is that those two things are not congruous with each other they're not in sync with each other now they may be this could just be a misunderstanding really good points yeah. that's so and good that, i mean that's actually what was going on like my wife and i actually wanted the exact same thing we just thought the other one was incapable of doing that and didn't want that. So right. we kept butting heads. And it's like, if you can step back, you might see like, I just want to be heard right. and validated. So does she. Like, that's exactly the same. I want to know that like, I can turn to her and she's there for me no matter what. And that's exactly what she wants too. So why are we fighting when we actually both seek the same thing? We're going about it in different ways. We're confused about where the other one sits in that spectrum but actually we're aligned. And that that's like the next step with it beyond the just not reacting. But when you can see that, it's like, wow, actually maybe there is a path here. 
And when you see that, then it's like, it's worth the work and it's worth trying to talk through it. And maybe now I know how to talk through it because I know what values to appeal to because nice. I know what they're after. So happiness seeking blew my mind. And I was like, that's the mechanism to change the relationship or that's the basis for the change. But the question is, how do you do it? There's lots of inspiring books out there, but it's like, how do I actually put this into action? And that's where I like to take things because again, yeah, like I'm a fixer. I got to do something with it. Um, you get it as a coach, like you want to make it better. <laughs> yes. So there's two, two other principles that made that really clear to me. The first is interconnectedness. So it's the notion that no one exists in and of themselves in a vacuum. Like we exist in relationship to each other and the actions of one impact another. So, um, you know, it's not like I'm all good or all bad. You're judging me that way based on the situation, how I'm interacting with you. And, you know, I use this example, like your boss comes down on you about your work and they're bad. But then your boss comes down on the slacker who sits next to you, who you can't stand. And that's a good boss. It's the same boss doing the exact same thing, but you see them completely different ways because you're relating to that situation differently because you all are interconnected. So that was like, okay, my happiness, their happiness, how I interact with it, there is a, there's like strings connecting us. So I actually have a way to pull on them or, or push. You can't really push on string, but like, I'll come up with a better analogy in the future. <laughs> okay. But there's, there's a mechanism through that interconnectedness for your understanding of the happiness to start mm -hmm. to affect each other. And then the last thing I think is just gives us hope. And that's the notion of impermanence. That's everything changes. So it's like, no one stays the same forever. You know, mohawk right. turn into tufts, turn into nothing. Um, if people age, their tastes change, their sense of things changes, their, the things they like. And I mean, all of it, every, the weather, everything changes. Yeah. So to feel like they're going to be this way forever, which is, pretty much how it tends to feel when you're in those moments. I can never love them again. They'll never love me. They're always going to be, you know, whatever. They may not be. And it may take a really long time and it may take the help of someone else, but they may not be that way forever. And what that tells you is it's worth giving it a shot. I, I love in your book, you talk about the concept of winning. Mm. And I would love for you to expand on that because I, I realize, and, and you do too, I think this is why you put it in the book, that a lot of people may see winning in, as you know there being one way of winning and what that means. But yeah. you, you expand on that, and I'd love to share, hear more about that. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a really common thing, that there can be only one winner or a means that you're right and they're wrong. And you have to ask yourself, like, is that the happiness you seek? So happiness seeking is not just to understand the other person, it's for yourself. Right. Like if you're arguing a point tooth and nail, it's like, do you actually even care about that? I know people who argue and they'll say in the argument, like, I don't even care, but, and then they go to town and it's like, well, if you don't care, why are you doing that? Right. What do you care about? Can we talk about that? So people will end up butting heads over points and trying to win one point versus the other when actually neither of them even cares about that. So what have you won in the end? You've alienated someone, you've made a relationship worse, and you don't even have the thing you wish you had. And I, I mean, I've got countless examples throughout my life of doing that. And um, a lot of us do. You know, we get locked in on a singular point, probably because something triggered us and we're reacting to it. And we lose sight of our own happiness. So the happiness seeking for yourself is a way to come back and say, like, you know, what is it I actually want? And I share the story of a coworker who was trying to get me fired. Um, it was a terrible situation. There are things she was saying. So she fabricated a bunch of data and then was using it. Um, I didn't know I had uncovered, like she had made a pretty serious series of errors over a number of years. And I was stumbling into uncovering them. And that's why she was trying to take me out. I didn't know any of that at the time. Wow. So she created a bunch of fake numbers to be like, you know, Brian's wrong and here's the real stuff. And um, my normal response would have been to fight her tooth and nail on every one of those points because I had data too, right out of our system. And it, you know, did not agree with anything she was saying. Um, she was a really good arguer, like really good and really respected. And she's brilliant. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that I would have won that. Like, could I have beaten her on every one of those points in front of our CEO? I don't know. 
So what would fighting on those points do? It might cost me my job. Most likely because she's that good. Um, and I didn't know that she was like trying to protect her own survival. So of course she's going to keep fighting to the death. It literally mm -hmm. was like me or you is how she saw it. Even though actually we both really wanted the same thing for the business. And if she had been honest about what was going on, we could have solved the problem. Um, but <laughs> happiness seeking wasn't, wasn't, you know, at play yet. Um, but I, she sent an email on a Friday night with all these points. Of course, it's like Friday night, right? It's going to ruin the weekend to the CEO, CCing me and our CFO. And like, Brian's doing all these things. Here's all the data. He's terrible. Uh -huh. um, and it was like, he should, he should have to answer for himself. Um, wow. So, you know, normal me. And of course, like at home, I'm freaking out and I'm like angry and I'm probably matched the color of my shirt. But the email I sent back thanked her, which people are like, what? You said, thank you. I'm like, Hey, you know, her name, thank you for this. Um, and I had such a desire to refute the points. And I just realized like A over email, it's not going to work. And B, that's not going to get us anywhere. So I just said, I have a different view of what's going on than you do. Why don't we all get together and talk? And I just let be, and I said something like, because I know, you know, we all want the business to be okay or to make it through this. And I left it at that. Nice. Um, and when we all got together, same thing. Um, I opened with that theme. You know, I know we all, you know, want the best for the business. You know, I know you raised some pretty serious concerns. I'd like to give you some space to share them. And then let's see how we can solve them. And then I just stepped back and I let her go off. And she basically just went through all the points. And when she was done, I thanked her. I reminded everyone why we were here. You know, like, you know, that's really important. Um, and I just said, you know, again, I have a different view of, of the data. Um, we don't, we can go through it. I don't know that we need to, because ultimately we are still in the same situation. Um, I'd like us to work through that. And then I offered her, I'm like, this is something I think I could do to help on your side. What do you think? So what I was trying to do is not stand against her happiness, mm -hmm. but show her like, I'm right here with you. And like, I'm going to step aside out of your way and maybe even lend you a hand to walk through to what you wish was happening. Um, it helped that I had the CFO with me and he's the owner of the official data and he agreed with me, but like, we didn't even have to go into it because it's not about winning on the points. Winning on the points would have just made her hate me even more. Right. So if she didn't win that day, she would have come back around and found another way to get me taken out. And winning on the points just mires you even deeper into the problem yeah. rather than opening up space for the solution. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I didn't get fired. Um, Good. <laughs> she didn't stay much longer. And unfortunately, wow. the problems that she was hiding ended up having a pretty serious uh, impact on the business that they're still dealing with. And that's really a shame that if she had been honest up and upfront about it, she had peers who respected her and we all could have worked together and try to work through it. But instead, she hit it for a really long time and treated us like enemies. And so things got out of control. And that's... Um, that's a shame. I, this sounds really weird. I wish she came for me like a year earlier because we could have unearthed things and pair Cause we did start working together to try to make things better. Like we could have done that sooner and, and the business would have been better off. Um, I don't know mm -hmm. why I would say something like, Oh, I wish that she had tried to get me fired earlier, but it served a really good purpose, you know? Yeah. Um, well, <sighs> So thank you for sharing that and yeah. and um and showing how even though it, it would have in many ways made sense for you to try and fight her and mm -hmm. argue your points and all that kind of stuff, how by you taking a completely different approach, um, you were able to, uh, it, you know, it, it sounds like you got two out of three, you at least save yeah. your job and, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the company, um, it's, I mean, I guess they're still dealing with stuff, but it sounds like they were able to, you were able to resolve some things that supported yeah. you guys in moving forward at that yeah. time. Yeah. yeah That's definitely. good. So where, okay, so you've got the 50, 75, 100 solution. Where's the 75 piece? Oh, 75, yeah. Um, so if it's not 50, 50, if it's not 100, how do you go from that 50, 50 to the 100? And what I realize is relationships are not two halves, they're quarters. So within each of us, we're split in half. And this is where all the fractions come in. But essentially, like we're half made of our actions, what we proactively choose to put out in the world, and half of us is our reactions to the other person or to the situation. When I realized that, 
and again, like credit to, to this book to open heart, clear mind. I started to see that, okay, well, what's going on in my wife or with that coworker or that plumber or whatever, a chunk of it's me. They're just responding to what I'm doing. So what if I give them something else to respond to than, you know, more aggravation or more like uh, tapping into the happiness seeking and give them something to react to that actually changes the negativity into something more positive. Mm -hmm. And so I control my half. There's 50 of it. I think we can all agree with that, whether it's yeah. easy or, you know, even if they're saying something mean, like how you react, it may be hard to control, but you still can. That's right. You own you. So we all own the 50, but we add another quarter of the whole because half of that person is a response to us. And it's when I saw that, that that's really where I was like, I know how to make things better now because I suddenly have control or influence over three quarters of the problem, not half. Like half and half, you're just going to keep butting heads, but I control my half and I can influence half of you by giving you a different version of me. And so if I have sway over three quarters of the problem, that will start to lead to a hundred because I'm, I'm doing better and I'm giving you a better version of me to react to, which means right. you're going to, whether you want to or not, you're going to be better too. And so I'm going to get back something better from you. So I'm not even going to have to try as hard. And it becomes a virtuous circle instead of a, a vicious one. Oh, that is, that's beautiful. And okay. And so in the book, I imagine you go even deeper into that 75 aspect of yep. it, right? To, yep. Okay. Awesome. And the thing I also actually wanted to say, I just want to go back to the winning for a second is um, to really just summarize what you elaborate in the book on too, is that winning isn't so much about winning as one person winning and another person losing, but it's about what's going to create harmony. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Just want to highlight that part. I love that. Um, so, so Brian, you know, you know, we're nearing the end of our conversation, but before we really get there, you know, let's just at this time where, you know, there's a lot going on in the world, of course, globally. And of course, some people are having, re you know, reactions or responses directly to what's happening globally. Yeah. Um, but also because of what's <laughs> happening globally, I know that that is also triggering for a lot of people, just other stuff yeah. in their personal life and, you know, their family life and, and just so stuff from the past, you know, is showing up and, yeah. um, you know, energetically speaking, I see it as it's being given an opportunity to breathe and be released mm. and you know by looking at it and i just i want to get your thoughts on that because you you talk about getting away from from fear and judgment in in your materials as well do you have any thoughts that you'd like to share just on what i was just describing yeah i mean i think this is where mindfulness has probably been the most useful tool for me and i make a very uh, pointed point um, effort, like really explicit effort, um, not just once a day, but multiple times to recenter myself. And there's been plenty of, you know, I, I start one of my morning routine things as I meditate and that's great. Um, that doesn't solve everything that I face in the day. And especially at times like these, um, whether it's, you know, the news cycle or just the gravity of the situation or memories, you know, one of the things in my household is, my wife's chronic illness means early days in, in this whole, you know, pandemic thing. Um, when they're like, oh, it's only old people and people with chronic illness. Don't worry. I'm like, oh. okay, well, 40% of the U.S. has a chronic illness. Yeah. And about that percentage, again, is in the old people category. And actually, they're finding that's not really the case, that it's everybody. But I was like, well, that's us. So that doesn't make me feel any better. And everybody knows someone or is someone in mm -hmm. one of those two categories and maybe has that person in their house. So it's everybody. Yeah. Now it really is everybody. But that that increased um, the anxiety for us. It increases the risks for us. And the uh, in my wife's issues, like it hits her immune system. So the chance that it would really take her down is a lot stronger. That brings up all kinds of past feelings. That time in 2011 where she spiraled. And so a lot of those symptoms are similar to the things that are described. And she has lots of symptoms on a regular basis. So it's always like, is that what it is? Am mm -hmm. I, is it back to 2011? Am I gonna make it? And then fear sets in. Um, 
it's a really understandable, natural way to respond to it. And the brain is just trying to protect itself. It's trying to tell you, this isn't okay, watch out. So it's, it's for a good reason, but it's also really damaging. So anxiety doesn't actually solve any of the problems and it raises a uh, chemical response in your body, hormones, et cetera, that are more damaging, they increase inflammation. So that sort of fear response, while its intention is good, its impact on you is bad. And so to try to work through that for both of us um, is a lot. Yeah. And so I find myself, um, you know, and this, this watch I have is a heart rate monitor on it. I do check from time to time if I'm feeling jittery or I'm feeling like um, my nerves aren't quite uh, like under my full control, which they are, but it doesn't feel that way. I'll glance at my heart rate and just see like, okay, that's a little bit high for me for like not working out. I'm just standing here. So I'll, there's been moments like, it's a nice thing about being home. I'll just sit on the floor nice. and just breathe really forcefully. And I watched, I did it today. My heart rate was like 119 sitting on the couch doing nothing. Um, wow. My resting heart rate's in the 40s. So that's not good. Like I, when I run, it's like 120 something. So that's not, that's okay. not right. And I brought it down into the high 60s within about 45 seconds, maybe in a, maybe a minute. That's great. It's great. And I need to do that from time to time. And I'm okay with that. And I recognize like, as soon as I have it back in control, mm -hmm. then I start to think about why did it get there in the first place? Where are my thoughts? And it's just bring it right back. Okay. Is that happening right now? No, it's nice. not. Is that something from before? You know, this uh, sky is falling kind of feeling or my mm -hmm. wife's like, one of her phrases is like, it feels like I'm dying. And I stupidly, like bad husband move, I was like, well, you've never died before, so how do you know? She's like the most <laughs> insensitive thing you can say, but it's also kind of true. I'm not saying anyone should say that, but like put it in my context, all these moments where I thought it was the end, it wasn't. At some point, you need to give that some credence, at least just to recognize like you don't know. Right, it, well, and I, it, let me just first say, I'm glad that your wife is alive and I, yes. I really hope that she, um, continue to just stay healthy and, you know, move through this with so much ease. Um, and on, on the flip side of what you just said, um, cause there is truth in that, right. Um, it, you know, you've never experienced this. So how do you fully know? But we also know, and this goes for everybody. It's like <clears throat> you've a hundred percent of the time, but I love this quote, whoever, whoever's it is hundred percent of the time, know what it's like to actually get through a challenging time and yeah. make it to the next day. Yeah. Right. And so it, like, that's also true. Yeah. Like, you know, you and so be, you wouldn't be alive if that wasn't true. Yeah. yeah. And so you must be doing something right because yeah. you know how to get through and, and continue to move forward and make it through the next day. So what did you do the day before? What worked? What worked? What didn't work? You know, and let's assess. And I love how you keep bringing it back to, I'm just going to pause and okay, then where were my thoughts? Yeah. And it's about self-love because if yes. you don't, if you don't recognize your capability and your value, you won't give any credit to the fact that you are still standing. Right. It couldn't have been because of you. It's like, okay, well, even with the help of others, why are others helping you? Because of you because they love you, because they care for you, because you asked for it, because you accepted it. Like you have to see that it comes back to you. Oh. And without that, it's really hard to get through, but you are through or you wouldn't be here anymore. So like, I, let's all just pause and reflect on the fact that we are here and give that some weight. Even though we, we invariably faced and will continue to face hard times because that's life. And we will yeah. also not face hard times. We will have plenty of great times and we will stand through all of them. The fact that you're in this moment worrying about it means you're so much more capable and resilient than you believed at that moment. Yes, yes. Ah, oh, I love that. Um, so Brian, where can people go if they want to connect with you and you know get your book or you know maybe coach with you, listen to your podcast, all of that? Yeah, so um, they can go to brianfalchuk.com and you can get to everything there. And I'm pretty active on social media and that's all linked there. The books are there, um, my articles are there, the podcast, the whole nine. So brianfalchuk.com is the easy single place to go for all of your Brian Falchuk-edness. 
Awesome. And I'm just going to go and spell that for everybody. So it's yes. B-R-Y-A-N, F is in Frank, A-L-C-H-U-K. Yes. Okay. Awesome. That's the hardest part. Once you get there, it's easy. But yeah, <laughs> you got you to spell my name. That's the tricky bit. Brian, thank you so much for being here today and just sharing uh, your expertise and and your stories and your wisdom and your authenticity. Because, um, you know, I, I just on the surface, I'm just going to point this out because I think this, you know, may come up on the surface. You look like a super fit, you know, go getter, like, you know, and that might have, and you, you are. <laughs> Sorry. That, it doesn't sink in, but thank you. It's okay. But that may be one perception. And I, what I absolutely love is there's so much more that that led to who you are today. Yeah. And um, that is true for every single person. 100%. And so I, I just, I just really, I don't know, I for some reason felt like there was, it was key for me to, to highlight that. And so, and so maybe for those who are with us, whether you're live or on the replay, wherever you're listening to this, you know, go deeper within yourself and take a look at, you know, who you are, like, where have you come from? What yeah. have you over, what have you overcome, you know, and how has that, you know, supported you in being who you are today? And, and, um, you know, earlier in the conversation, we, took it all the way down to self love, how that's really so key and being at the core of being able to believe in yourself and be able to even, you know, be more mindful and achieve more of those goals and move forward. And um, I just, I just love everything about our conversation today, Brian. So again, thank you. <laughs> Me too. Thank you very much. Man. Absolutely. So, so that is our show for today. And, you know, so thank you to Brian for being here and thank you for everybody who's been with us. Remember, Every day is always a new day. Wherever you are today does not have to be where you are tomorrow. And just, you know, you are here. You have done, you have been successful 100% of the time. If you're listening to this, you've been successful 100% of the time in moving through whatever took place before to get you to where you are today. And, you know, allow whatever you're experiencing now to really be prime time for you to, yes, go inward and be more mindful and present with yourself because you deserve that. Uh, Brian was talking earlier about, you know, why do other people love you? Cause you're worth it. And so if you're in that space of going, but you know, hmm, but am I worth it? Or why am I worth it? You know, then this is your moment to really own that, to receive that, to be that, to feel that, to know that because you are worth that love and, and believing in yourself and all of that. So, I will leave you with that. That is our show for today. Have a wonderful day and I'll see you all on the next Every Day is a New Day show. Bye everybody. And that's today's show. So what are you taking away? Let me know down in the comments wherever you listened or watched today's episode and connect with me on Facebook on the Every Day is a New Day show and coaching page or visit kimoneillcoaching.com for more info. Remember, every day is always a new day. Wherever you are today does not have to be where you are tomorrow. There is always hope, and you will always be amazing. I'll see you next time.